So the topic of my presentation is experience with time-lapse monitoring using ocean bottom nodes in deep water fields. My name is Paul Hatchell. I'm a geophysicist and work for Shell's aerial monitoring team. I'm based in Houston. So our industry is very impressive and offers a number of excellent solutions for time-lapse monitoring. These include the use of permanently installed ocean bottom cables, also known as permanent reservoir monitoring or PRM, the use of ocean bottom node surveys, and towed streamer seismic surveys. All of these technologies have proven themselves in our industry and each have their pros and cons that need to be considered when planning a reservoir monitoring campaign. In this talk, I'm going to discuss some of the advantages associated with ocean bottom node surveys. I will discuss three main advantages of these surveys. First is about repeatability. Ocean bottom nodes allow us to accurately repeat the source and receiver locations while acquiring a wide azimuth data set. Our experience is that we can repeat node locations to about 10 meters and shots to about 5 meters. Surface infrastructure has little impact on node surveys because shots and receivers are decoupled and the nodes can be placed right next to the infra infrastructure. The second advantage of nodes is that in deep water, the upgoing and downgoing wave fields can be imaged separately. And because they have very different illumination and ray paths, we are essentially getting a second survey for free. And we have shown that we can combine the up and the downgoing waves to improve noise suppression on the 4D differences. We call this the 4D similarity stack. And the last point I'd like to make is the scalability of node solution. Uh, we can cost effectively shoot a subset of a given node survey to image a targeted zone at low cost. And this enables frequent monitoring of zones of interest. We call this development instantaneous 4D or I4D. So let's start with some of the challenges of acquiring time-lapse seismic in the Gulf of Mexico. Most of Shell's existing fields start out life with a streamer seismic survey. But in the Gulf of Mexico, there are large eddy currents known as loop currents that create significant feathering of towed streamer cables. The map shown on the left shows sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see the dark orange loop currents that are swirling around. It is not unusual to observe 30 degree and larger feather angles on streamer surveys acquired when these loop currents are present. These currents are very unpredictable and make the surveys difficult to repeat. So another challenge has to do with surface infrastructure that is generally not present on the initial streamer seismic surveys. The picture on the upper left shows a typical baseline survey shot on a racetrack configuration. The different colors here represent the sailing direction. In this model, a spar is placed at the center of the survey and a monitor survey needs to try to sail around it. These create non-repeated acquisition, including dead headlines shown in the middle and two boat undershoots that try to fill in the hole left by the spar. In the bottom panel are QC plots showing the impact of these types of undershoots on a real 4D seismic survey. The map on the bottom left shows the normalized difference between base and monitor close to the water bottom. And we can see the pattern that was left by the non-repeated lines there. The middle panel is a vertical cross-section through the subtraction zone, and it shows that these effects propagate all the way from the seafloor down into the deep reservoir layers. The map on the lower right is an NRMS repeatability map that shows that away from the problem areas, uh, we have a very good NRMS of around 10%, but in the vicinity of the surface infrastructure, the NRMS becomes as large as 30 or 40%. There's a very large problem underneath the platform. Node surveys solve the repeatability problem by decoupling the source and the receivers. Nodes are placed on the seafloor using ROV vessels, and the shots are acquired with a source vessel that acquires a regular grid. Holes in shooting around platform are very small compared to a tow streamer survey. The pictures on the right show a view from the node deployment vessel during one of our surveys. In the background, you can see some of the platforms that the survey needs to work around. Our experience is that we can repeat the node positions to around 10 meters and the shots to around 5 meters. And the map on the lower right shows the NRMS map from one of our deep water node surveys. Here we see a 6% NRMS, and we note that in the vicinity of the platform, there's no impact on data quality. So now what I'd like to do is compare the NRMS we obtained with our node survey to those of other types of surveys that we typically acquire. 
It's well known that the NRMS of a 4D seismic survey depends on how well we repeat the shot and receiver positions. The example shown here compares a number of streamer surveys and it compares the average delta source delta receiver locations on the horizontal axis with the NRMS that was obtained from these surveys. We can see that as the, the survey is better repeated, we get lower and lower NRMS values. If we compare what happens with permanent systems, such as those installed at Valhall and Ecofisk, where they have no receiver positioning errors, uh, they report NRMS values that fit very nicely along this trend uh, and obtain very excellent uh, NRMS values. Uh, with our Deepwater OBN surveys, we're getting NRMS values that are comparable to those obtained in PRM systems. Now I'd like to turn to the second advantage of node systems, namely the ability to image up and downgoing waves and combining these to reduce 4D noises using a process that we call 4D similarity stack. The picture at the top left shows what is meant by up and downgoing waves. Downgoing waves have an additional reflection at the free surface and their illumination characteristics are very different from the upgoing waves. For example, we can get an image at the seafloor using the downgoing wave field and that's not possible with the upgoing wave field. The idea of the 4D similar, similarity stack is that well below the seafloor, where the up and downgoing waves have good illumination, the 4D signals should be quite the same, but the 4D noises should be very different. And the goal in the 4D similarity stack is to compare the 4D differences. And when they look identical, we stack them. Uh, and when they look very different, uh, we tend to mute those areas. And in the bottom of the panel, we show some examples of the upgoing 4D difference, the downgoing 4D difference, and the 4D similarity stack. And you can see there that the noises are greatly reduced. So to understand how this process works, let's start by looking at the baseline image of the up and downgoing wave fields. As shown in this picture, the upgoing waves are shown on the left, downgoing waves are shown on the right. Because of the differences in ray pass and illumination, we have to align these images and apply a spatially dependent scaling, which we apply to the upgoing waves to match the downgoing waves. The same scaling function will be also be applied to the monitor data. In this example, the up and the downgoing images look nearly identical. Now we are looking at the 4D differences of the upgoing data on the left and the downgoing data on the right. Note that in the shallow section, the upgoing difference has a lot more noise. This is because of poor illumination there and the fact that the upgoing data was scaled to the downgoing wave field. In the deeper section, the illumination of the up and the downgoing waves is quite comparable. And the 4D signals look very similar. And the signal to noise between the upgoing and the downgoing looks pretty comparable as well. So the two pictures of the 4D differences are similar. How do we take advantage of this? Well, one obvious thing to do is to stack the two together. And that would give us a square root 2 in signal to noise ratio. The other is to stack them based on how similar they are. And that is what we refer to as the 4D similarity stack. So let's see how these two stacks look. This picture compares the straight stack on the left with the similarity stack on the right. Note how the noisy areas are nearly completely muted by the similarity operation. Our experience is that the volume on the right is spectacularly good for volume scanning of the 4D signals. And techniques like bottom body checking and automatic picking work very well in this domain. The noise reduction using up and down going waves is really only a deep water technique and does not apply in shallow water fields. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to my uh, third and last example of the advantages of OBN data that we call I4D, which stands for instantaneous 4D. Here the goal is to obtain frequent low cost monitoring for our deep water fields. The main idea of the I4D is that we can shoot a subset of our original survey and look at targets of interest that might change quickly with time. These would include features associated with pressure changes and compartmentalization, induced fraction and out of zone injection. Also the movement of waterfronts. OBN and data are ideal for I4D because OBN data are of high quality and we can scale OBN data, which means it's cost effective to repeat a subset of the data set. We think that I4D fills a niche between conventional seismic and permanent reservoir monitoring. 
This cartoon shows how this tech might, technique might be used in practice. Here, full field surveys are acquired at long time intervals, say several years, with small scale I4Ds acquired in between them. We can think of this solution as a low cost life of field monitoring using I4D. We were not going to monitor everything all the time, but we will monitor zones of interest frequently. Here's an example that compares a sparse, low-cost, frequent acquisition to a conventional full-field survey repeated every three years. In the top example, two surveys were acquired using only 16 nodes and 16 shot lines at day 0 and day 54. And the difference on the right shows a 54-day difference, and there's a clear signal above the injection well indicated by the blue dots. Now, what could cause a signal like this after just 54 days? The lower example shows a full field acquisition over the same interval at year 0 and year 3. After three years, we can see that this injection zone has gone partially out of zone into the overburden. This is something we could have seen much sooner on the 54-day survey. To properly monitor our fields, we need to be aware of situations like this. For example, we wouldn't want to drill into the pressurized zone above our injection well. So monitoring frequently, we think, is very important for these types of situations. If you already have an existing full field survey, you can process this to decide what is the best configuration of an I4D survey. In the top example, we show a full fold survey with a large shot box indicated in red and 520 no 28 nodes located in the center. The right hand side shows the 4D difference obtained with this survey. And the map on the left hand side is a map extracted at the horizon shown on the seismic section. The bottom panel shows the same data, but now we're only imaging it with 120 of the nodes and using a much smaller shot area. And the resulting 40 different seismic is on the right. And you can see that most of the 40 signals are just as clear on the I4D survey as they are on the, on the full fold survey. Some degradation takes place on the edges, but for rapid monitoring of the 80% solution, we find the I4D method to be highly cost effective. Note that in the uh, attribute map on the left, it looks very similar to the one we obtained with the full fold data as well. Here's an example of an I4D result on one of our deep water subsalt reservoirs. This survey was acquired with just 120 nodes and a small shot box that could be acquired in weeks instead of the months of a full fold survey. In the upper left, we see the baseline I4D image showing a salt body and some deep reservoirs. The I4D design does not image the base of salt. We're able to see that on the full fold data, but that is not important for the monitoring the time lapse changes at the reservoir level. In the lower right, we can see the I4D difference section. And as planned, we're able to image the waterfront movement that we can see below the salt body. This I4D survey is also one of the finest subsalt 4D images I've seen in the industry. So to conclude, I would like to again reiterate some of the advantages of node surveys for time-less monitoring. First is repeatability. Ocean bottom nodes allow us to accurately repeat source and receiver locations while acquiring a wide azimuth data set. Second is that in the deep water, we can take advantage of up and down going wave fields and combine these to improve noise suppression on 4D differences. This is called the 4D similarity stack. And lastly is the scalability of nodes. We can cost effectively shoot a subset of a given node survey to image a targeted zone at low cost. This enables frequent monitoring of targets of interest, and we call this I4D. So just to finish up, I would like to acknowledge a number of people who have helped with this work. Uh, I'm not going to read all the names here, but in particular, I'd like to acknowledge our vendor, Fairfield Nodal, who acquired uh, the ocean bottom node data, and all the Shell staff members that are listed as well.